In the previous video, we defined the Dirichlet convolution of two arithmetic uh, functions, and we worked through a couple examples. And in this video, we'll see what properties this new operation has. First, as an operation on the set of arithmetic functions that have the same codomain, co a convolution has the following properties. It's commutative. The convolution f star g is the same function as g star f. It's associative, so f star g star h is the same function as f star g star h. Also, the function epsilon of n, given by the uh, formula that epsilon of 1 is equal to 1 and epsilon of anything else is bigger, is an identity element for this operation. If you convolve epsilon with f, either on the left or the right, you end up with the same function f that you started with. And the big one, if f and g are both multiplicative functions, then the convolution is also a multiplicative function. Here is really why we're interested in it and what it has to do with the general theme of multiplicative functions. The convolution of two multiplicative functions is also multiplicative. Well, we're going to go through and establish these one by one. First up in our list of things to prove, commutativity. f star g is the same function as g star f. Well, suppose f and g are two arithmetic functions and n is a positive integer, we simply need to prove that f star g of n and the g star f of n are always equal. Well, f star g of n is a sum over the divisors of n, f of the divisor, and then g of what we've been calling the cofactor n over d. Observe, however, that we're summing up over the set of all the factors of n. These two numbers always multiply to n, and I sum up over all of the choices of d. But each choice of d gives me a very specific choice of n over d, so I could just as well have summed up over the cofactors n over d rather than the factors d. We've seen this doesn't really matter. The factors of 6, for example, are 1, 2, 3, and 6, with cofactors 6, 3, 2, and 1. They range over the same set. So instead of summing over the divisors, we can sum over the cofactors. And then f of d is the same thing as n over n over d. But now, if I just rephrase the cofactor n over d as the factor e, we have g of the cofactor, f of n over the cofactor. But now, instead of n over d being the cofactor to the factor d, we're saying that e is the factor with cofactor n over that, where e and n over d are simply the same number. But this is exactly g star f of n, where we simply wrote our factors as the letter e rather than the letter d. Essentially, since the factor cofactor list run over the same things, it doesn't actually matter whether you're plugging factors into f and cofactors into g, or vice versa. And from that we see that the convolution operator is commutative. f star g and g star f are the same function. Next up, associativity. Let's show that f convolved with g convolved with h is the same thing as f convolved with g convolved with h. So suppose f, g, and h are arbitrary arithmetic functions and n is an arbitrary positive integer. We just need to show that plugging n into the two functions, the one on the left and the one on the right, are always equal. Well, here is plugging n into the function on the left. And let's unpack this. First, we're going to understand this convolution here. So pretend that g star h is a fixed function and we're not dealing with it yet. I have f star something else. So I sum over the divisors of n, f of the divisor, g star h of the cofactor. Now let's unpack this convolution. Okay, so this summation and f of the factor d are not being uh, dealt with here, but g star h of the cofactor n over d, I look for factors of that, g of the factor h of n over d over e, which simplifies down like this. So here we have a representation of f star g star h of n. And just to be clear, in terms of parentheses, we have this. Okay, so inside the first summation, we have f of d times g star h of n over d. Now, if we distribute this over the entire sum, notice what we have. So what we have is f of something times g of something h of something else. Now, this is a big nasty sum, and I distribute f of d across that entire thing, and then I have a whole bunch of terms like that. But all of the terms individually are f of something, g of something, h of something. D is a factor of n, 
then I get a factor of n over d and n divided by that. So the trio of numbers x, y, and z, where x is what's being plugged into f, y is what's being plugged into g, and z is what's being plugged into h, always have the property that their product altogether is n. Here I would have uh, d, e, and n over d, e. When I multiply them all together, I get out n. So we're representing that as three distinct factors of n that multiply together to n. So we're going to write it like that. The convolution here, this left function, is simply the sum over all possible choices of three positive factors that multiply together to n, f of 1, g of the second, h of the third. And this is irrespective of order, by the way. If you were plugging in n equals 6, 1, 6, 1 would be a different choice than 6, 1, 1 would be a different choice than 1, 1, 6. Similarly, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, 2, 1, 3, and so forth would all be different choices. So for any choice of x, y, and z that multiply together to form your number n, plug the first into x, the second into y, the third into z, and you can flop the order around. Then you have to sum up over all possible choices. In the original representation, if we factor f of x out for each possible choice, we would call that f of d, and that's essentially what we have here. All possible choices for your first number, group those terms together, and then factor that f out, and what remains are all of your other choices of g and h. So that's what we have written here. Okay, x can be any factor of n, so if I look for all the terms that have the same choice of x, I could factor f of that out, and that would be what I have here. Instead, however, if I factor out according to what my unique choices of z are, well, z has to be a factor of n, so I'm going to call it d prime, and factor that out. So for each factor of d of n that I call d prime, f and g would have to be two other factors of n, so that this product formed n, if I'm representing this same sum right here. But this is just another way of writing this convolution, which is the same reasoning we had up here. So ultimately, this convolution is the same as this one. In other words, Dirichlet convolution is an associative operation on arithmetic functions. Now by commutativity, this f star g star h can just be commuted to be f star g star h, and now it looks exactly like what we wanted. What's the identity element? We claimed it's this function epsilon. Okay, so epsilon of n is 1 if you plug in 1, so epsilon of 1 is 1, but otherwise epsilon of 2 is 0, epsilon of 3 of 0, and so forth. And we claim that this is uh, the identity element for Dirichlet convolution. So let f be any arithmetic function and n be a positive integer. We just directly compute that epsilon convolved with f is the sum over all the divisors of n, epsilon of d, f of n over d. But epsilon is a really straightforward function. The only term that you can plug into the epsilon function that doesn't produce a zero is epsilon of one. Epsilon of any other factor would spit out a zero and you can ignore it. So the only choice of D in this long, long sum where the epsilon term is not zero is epsilon of one, and here you get f of n over one, and all the other terms are zero, and that's just f of n. So epsilon star f of n is always f of n. And commutativity tells me that f star epsilon is the same thing as epsilon star f. And we've already seen that that's exactly the function f. So whether you do Dirichlet convolution with this epsilon function on the left or the right, it doesn't matter. You're not going to change whatever the other function was. This is our identity element for this operation. Next up, the main result that we want to focus on. If two functions are both multiplicative, then so is their Dirichlet convolution. Suppose f and g are two arbitrary multiplicative functions. Now I just want to show that f star g is multiplicative, so I need to plug in a number n times m where n and m are relatively prime. So pick a pair of numbers that are relatively prime. For any factor of the product n, m, we've already established that there is a unique way to factor d as a factor of n times a factor of m. And since n and m are relatively prime, the factors of them must be relatively prime as well. 
Therefore, let's denote x to be n over d1 and y to be m over d2, where d1 and d2 are, is the factorization of d into a factor of n times a factor of m. Okay, so n over d1 has to be a factor of n, m over d2 has to be a factor of m, and since n and m are relatively prime, so are x and y. Then we can compute. If I do the Dirichlet convolution f star g on nm, I sum up over the divisors of nm, f of d, g of nm over d. But d can be uniquely factored as a factor of n and a factor of m. So every choice of a factor of nm is equivalent to a choice of a factor of n and a factor of m, whose product is d. So I'm simply replacing d with the two factors d1 and d2. But remember that f is multiplicative, d1 and d2 are relatively prime. Also, n over d1, x, and m over d2, y are relatively prime and g is multiplicative. So since f is multiplicative and these are relatively prime, I can split it like this. Since g is multiplicative and n over d1 and m over d2 are relatively prime, I can split it up like that. And now I'm just going to move some terms around. f of d1 times g of n over d1, I'm going to make its own term. f of d2, g of m over d2 gets its own grouping. And now I exactly have f star g of n, f star g of m. So we've established that the convolution f star g of n m distributes as the convolution on n times the convolution on m. Under the assumption n and m are relatively prime, of course, but therefore we've shown when f and g are both multiplicative, so is f star g. Let's now work through an example problem that shows us how this is actually useful in solving problems. Suppose f is a multiplicative function, well therefore I only need to know how it acts on prime powers, and I'm going to declare that f of a prime power is tau of k, the exponent. Let's compute the value of f star mu of 81,000, where mu is the Mobius function. Since f is a multiplicative function, that was a given, and the Mobius function is multiplicative, we proved that, the convolution f star mu is definitely multiplicative. Any function that's multiplicative, I only need to understand how it acts on prime powers. And since this is a convolution, that's going to involve knowing what the factors of that prime power are. But factors of prime powers are easy to list out. It's just all of the other powers of that prime up to and including the one in question. So we can compute f star mu of p to the k. We list out all of the divisors, one, p, p squared all the way up to p to the k, f of those times mu of the cofactor, p to the k over 1 is p to the k, p to the k over p is p to the k minus 1, p to the k over p squared is p to the k minus 2, and so forth. So I'm just summing up f of d mu of p to the k over d, where the divisors simply range over this list because those are the only divisors of a prime power. Now we're going to make great use of the Mobius function. The only power of a prime that you plug into the Mobius function without it vanishing is mu of a prime is minus one and mu of one is one. Mu of any higher power of a prime is zero. Therefore, all of these initial terms vanish, leaving only f of p to the k minus one times minus one and f of p to the k times one. And there we have it, f of p to the k minus f of p to the k minus one. Now we defined f of p to the k to be tau of the exponent. So f of p to the k is tau of k, f of p to the k minus one is tau of k minus one. Now that we know how the convolution acts on prime powers, we can factor 81,000 as two cubed, three to the fourth, and five cubed, and get that f star mu of 81,000 must distribute across those prime powers as f star mu of two cubed times f star mu of three to the fourth times f star mu of five cubed. But we also know that f star mu of a prime power is tau of the exponent minus tau of the exponent minus one. So what's f star mu of two cubed? It's tau of three minus tau of two. f star mu of three to the fourth is tau of four minus tau of three. f star mu of five cubed, the exponent is three, is tau of three minus tau of two. Tau of the exponent minus tau of the exponent minus one. Exponent three, tau of three minus tau of two. 
exponent 4, tau of 4 minus tau of 3, exponent 3, tau of 3 minus tau of 2, and we're multiplying all of these together because we know this function is multiplicative. Tau of 3 is simply 2, but so is tau of 2. So 2 minus 2 gives me 0. Tau of 4 is 3, and tau of 3 is 2. Therefore, 3 minus 2 gives me 1. And then again, we get tau of 3 minus tau of 2 is 0. So overall, this is 0. Great big grand result, f star mu of 81,000 is actually 0. So this was an example of a problem that could be assigned using Dirichlet convolution and properties of multiplicative functions.